we've touched on a couple of critical elements. Um, the, the critical element that stands out for me is really a question of human resources. And, and human resources are interesting in that, in that they are the real receptors into the economy for foreign direct investment, for large major projects. So if we're not looking after our human resources, you know, if we're not finding ways to make the family stronger, to give them that economic, that financial independence, then you're going to be losing the most important part of the growth equation. I saw a 2012 study recently um, from the World Bank, I think it was, that said that we lose 80% of our university graduates to migration. 80%. Now, if you want to talk, I mean, at a higher level, if you want to talk about absorptive capacity of our economy, that's the absorptive capacity going through the door right there. So that's like pouring water in a bottomless bucket. We've got to look after the individual. We've got to look after the family to produce talented individuals to be able to be those receptors. And so that's where I think certainly financial institutions like ourselves come in and, and other institutions as well. So very good. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. Okay, we're zipping along because I understand we have a bit of a time constraint, or the minister has a time constraint. Um, we're now going to have a presentation on e economic independence on the macro level from our Minister of Finance and Planning, Dr. The Honorable Peter Phillips. Dr. Phillips is currently the Member of Parliament for East Central St. Andrew, which he has represented since 1994. He has had a distinguished career in government, politics, and academia. He has been a Fulbright scholar. Here we go with the scholarships thing again. A, a former lecturer in the Department of Government and the Consortium Graduate School at the University of the West Indies. Dr. Phillips has published extensively on a variety of Caribbean development issues. Fresh from his success of engineering the Petrocaribe debt buyback, he will be turning his efforts to ensuring the non that non-commercial bank financial institutions will be allowed to broaden their convenience product offerings, such as credit cards, in order to allow VMBS to drive greater financial. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> That's not a part of the introduction. Sorry, Dr. Phillips. That's actually my wish, wish list. How did that get in there? I don't know. Clover, how did that get in there? Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, please give your undivided attention to our keynote speaker, Dr. Honorable Peter, Dr. The Honorable Peter Phillips. is decoration. All right, uh, let me recognize uh, chairman of this afternoon's function, Mr. Michael McMorris, uh, Mr. Richard Powell, uh, other members of the platform, Mrs. Williams, Professor Williams. I don't know if there's a, is there a connection between the Williamses. <laughs> Mr. Burchison, president of the PSOJ, William of Food, President of the uh, Jamaica Chamber of Commerce, this, uh, Director General of the PSOJ, PIOJ, I get my, my alphabets confused. Um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, at first of all, I'd like to congratulate Victoria Mutual Building Society on this inaugural economic forum and for the opportunity to address you this afternoon. I think the stage properly set earlier between the individual prospects and the national circumstance really represents an important uh, context in which to address the issues that are before us. And certainly the, the, the title of, of this seminar, Charting a Course for Financial and Economic Independence, really highlights, I think, many of the issues that arise 
in relation to the economic reform program which the country has been pursuing over the past three years. Indeed, today, significant to some extent in that we started the, the ninth review mission of the International Monetary Fund and the Extended Fund Facility started today. Um, I was just offered a cup of coffee a while ago and I, I, they probably thought I was looking um, forlorn, but there's no basis for any such assumption. I must say that I have every positive experti expectation about the com successful completion of the ninth review. Now, I think examining where we are as a country, it's important to note, and there's a, often a, a general uh, mood of pessimism that, uh, that sometimes overtakes us. But the fact of the matter that as a country, we have accomplished much. And it often is worth taking note of the fact that we have sustained our democracy, maintained a set of independent uh, civic institutions, our judiciary, our civil service. We have developed a vibrant industrial relations tradition and infrastructure and quite frankly have imprinted ourselves globally in a way that no country as, of similar size has done in, in the world cultural space, whether it be sports or music or our other artistic works. Our people have demonstrated tremendous innovativeness and creativity. And it's worth noting because much of this represents economic resource that we have not yet managed to, to optimize the benefits of. That said, it is also true to say that as a country, we have failed to achieve sustainable economic growth. And I dare say that there is no real value in trying to engage in our traditional blame games uh, that we have become so adept at in the country. This, the most significant retardant to our capacities to go over the years has been the build-up of our public debt. The level of debt build-up didn't happen overnight. Successive Governments over the past 40 years have contributed to the build-up of the debt. Our, the fact is that if you look at the purchasing power, average purchase, purchasing power of income per person in 2012 is the same as it was 40 years ago. And the debt over the same period has grown at more than 600%. So 600% rise in the debt average growth of income over the period per capita income less than 1%. This is why I think we had reached the point where fundamental reform of our macroeconomic realities became not just desirable, but absolutely necessary. High debt levels deplete our budgetary resources as increasing share of the country's budget becomes, becomes devoted to, to debt servicing. The, the, we were in a situation 2012 where we were spending about 80% of our budget on debt servicing and wages, which in effect meant that the remaining 20% is what would, have, what would be needed to supply 
all the other services, including the, the, the investment program that, that, that Professor Williams is outlining. High debt increases the cost of borrowing for the country, given the impact of the high debt to GDP ratio. It's an impediment to growth, and certainly the negative impact on the country's credit profile means that it is not a burden just borne by the, by the governmental authorities, by the sovereign, but it affects the borrowing costs of every single enterprise, every single investor in the country, and ultimately creates a condition whereby government increasingly crowds out the credit markets and crowds out private investors in credit markets. Now, the first task then involves reducing our debt as measured by the debt to GDP ratios, which will help transform all the limitations listed above. And we have managed to achieve significant progress in that regard. The recent successful completion of the Petro Cariba transaction will further enhance the successes already achieved in that regard by reducing our debt to GDP headline number by approximately 10% and move us ahead of the curve, so to speak, as far as the targets in the economic reform program and the extended fund facility is concerned. The transaction will also reduce our debt in nominal terms and will also have the desired effect in reducing our debt service over the life of the transaction. But the challenge before us is not only about debt reduction and maintaining a high primary surplus or expenditure restraint, necessary though that is. It is also about implementing far-reaching structural reforms aimed at making our economy more competitive and quite frankly reorienting the relative balance between the state on the one hand and the private investor community on the other hand. Because if we don't do this and if we create an environment which we had over many years created where in effect the economy was increasingly reliant on state expenditures primarily as the driving force and where all investment because of the the, the, the structural imbalances that have become inherent in this high debt environment where no investment could take place unless there were sector specific incentives then you rapidly get to the point where not only is all your income is all your budget being devoted to debt service but any further investment because it is so to speak incentive heavy doesn't result in any improvement fundamentally in your in your in your in your fiscal situation now a number of measures have been undertaken and the fiscal reforms undertaken so far have carried us into a new ballpark very necessary but one, I dare say, not sufficient. But there are new economic possibilities and opportunities becoming apparent for investors at every level. A stable platform has been created. Our inflation numbers are the lowest they have been in almost 50 years. Inflation running at 4.4%, the last inflation numbers, and still expected to trend further downwards. Our balance of payments on the current account has sharply improved from 
a deficit of 13.4% of GDP in 2011-12 to 5.3% in 2014-15. And the current projection is for a current account deficit to improve to 2.8%. And when taken, when viewed alongside the inflows of foreign direct investment and other inflows, we can see the prospect of our balance of payments current account being fundamentally in balance first time in many, many years. Foreign direct investment in 2014 amounted to approximately 700 million US dollars, the second highest in the English speaking Caribbean. And our net international reserves at the end of July stood at approximately 2.4 billion US dollars, far away from the approximately US 800 million that it was in, in 2013. Unemployment is trending down. It needs to go down quicker. The rate, which was 16.3% in April 2013, as compared with 13.2% in April 2015, the Unemployed labor force declining by some 43,000 per persons in the period. We, all of these corrections have been accomplished with great sacrifice. Sacrifices endured by the individual taxpayer. Sacrifices involved in the uh, containment of expenditures. Difficult choices have had to have been made in, re in relation to uh, government expenditure. And we should not forget the sacrifices that were made by our bondholders in the NDX bonds. And I'm certain that many who are here, including those here, Look forward to the payout of some $62 billion J payout on the, the first major payout on the, on the index bonds, which will have coming up in February, fully financed already. So I would just say, watch out, prepare. In a good way. <laughs> no, in a very good way. Because in addition to what we are already seeing as uh, competitive forces developing in the credit markets, including a sharp improvement in the or, or expansion in the market for commercial paper domestically, further reforms uh, and including this payout will drive not only further reductions in commercial banking rates, but should also see a build-up in, in other sources of credit in the private credit markets that will be an additional driver, we hope and expect, in relation to uh, investments. As we make, as we, as we establish this platform, and move forward, more possibilities come forward. Yesterday, we signed the wage agreements with the Jamaica Confederation of Trade Unions, which saw an end to the wage freeze. It didn't mean that all that was sought by the unions was satisfied. It certainly will mean an adjustment to the government's budget arrangements. But what is significant about it is that it represented a sharing of the benefits that have resulted so far, not to the extent that some would wish. But I want to commend the trade union leadership and the public sector workers for a far-sightedness in recognizing what you, the very issue that was posed here, 
the linkage between their own personal circumstances and the prospects for the country. So they fashioned their own demands in the end, recognizing that there was value in ensuring that the sacrifices already made were not destroyed by a set of unreasonable demands and expectations which would derail the basic program and they are to be commended for that level of farsightedness. <laughs> we remain committed as a government to achieving the agreed medium-term targets on wages to GDP and this will require in turn even greater focus on other elements of public sector reform that are already, some of which are already underway. It will mean, for example, the implementation of more modern, adept, flexible uh, information communications platforms, measures to improve the, the efficiency and the interface between members of the public in areas like tax administration, customs administration, and others to ensure that we are able to sustain a reduction in uh, transaction costs for investors and continue to improve our rankings on the doing business indices that are looked at worldwide as, uh, as in order to determine the, the effic efficacy of the investment environment. The continuing positive results emanating from the business and consumer confidence surveys confirm our local investors' acceptance of the economic reform program and their interest in participating in tangible ways. Whether it is a businessman expressing interest in expansion or a consumer being more optimistic about job prospects, it is clear that the sacrifices are beginning to bear fruit. I'm particularly pleased about consumer confidence results, which the last survey which in the last survey rose above the average level of the survey during the past 15 years. Whilst reducing debt and restoring macroeconomic stability provide the foundation, I think we need to identify those areas where there is, in which there is particular opportunity for investment and where we will have to redouble our efforts on both sides of the main stakeholder divide, that is say, public sector on the one hand, private sector on the other, and other elements of the national community. There are, I think, some obvious issues which arise in this regard, and I want to highlight, first of all, the agricultural sector, which represents a continuing uh, center of opportunity, arising in particular from the adjustments in exchange rate values, which have changed the balance between the, the, the imported foreign foodstuffs and locally produced foodstuffs as far as the, the choices are concerned. There really is no basis for us sustaining a situation where we are importing things like sorrel and June plum juice and uh, concentrate in the country. On the other hand, it requires modern production systems. We can't continue to believe that June plum is going to be planted only by cows and birds and that all we have to do is collect it. We have to introduce modern productive systems and that in turn will require the collaboration between the private investor and the state. The state to provide things like land titles which will unlock the market dynamism in many parts of the, of the, of the agricultural community. The state also needing to ensure that appropriate irrigation systems which have traditionally 
been focused only on a few export crops rather than in the whole gamut of production arrangements in the agricultural sector. This remains one area. The agro-parks remain an area of focus and there are for expansion, but it, it will require much more um, to be done. The business process outsourcing sector continues to expand and the recent announcement that Jamaica is one of the most sought after destinations for major BPO clients is in line with the expectations that many more jobs will be created. What we are seeing and what we is a trend now of private investment moving in reliant on their own financing from the banks rather than on development bank financing and getting into that operation. It's a trend to be encouraged and which does not relieve the state of obligations to continue to market, develop the appropriate taxation regimes that are competitive globally as has been done in collaboration with the with the sector and at the same time ensuring that what I might call the infrastructure needed by the by the by BPO operators continues. Among the more exciting developments is the movement into medical uh, medical records moving up the value chain in relation to uh, troubleshooting, computers troubleshooting and the like, all of which shows that the critical value of this sector that it can employ labor at all levels of, of, of the value chain from the from the multiple scholarship winners like Professor Williams through to your basic high school lever has an opportunity there and it represents a fundamental opportunity which will transform the employment landscape of the country in short order. The tourism sector continues to show positive signs. In fact, Currently, there are over 2,000 rooms under construction and an equivalent number in being refurbished. And the, the, the range of prospects at all layers in the system represents perhaps the most, uh, the most active segment, active situation in the market that has been seen in many, many decades. And the linkages uh, between our agricultural sector and our tourism sector and our manufacturing sector is absolutely critical. Mention has been made also of infrastructure, supportive infrastructure. Ports, airports, the North-South Highway which will be opened in the early part of the next calendar year which will again transform all of those possibilities, not just for the tourist trade, but for the, but for our port operations and logistics operations flowing from that. And it will ultimately, that and other infrastructural developments will ultimately change the pattern of residential uh, arrangements in the country because you know money will be probably as close as some parts of the corporate area to other parts of the corporate area in time terms which will make your schemes which you will finance not having to be concentrated in the corporate area but in fact moving out to use more affordable assets um, to provide the base. But consider something. When that highway opens, the hotelier in Ocherius 
will be indifferent in terms of time whether his client comes in at Norman Manley or at Donald Sangster Airport. It opens up a range of possibilities. Opportunities when we used to play cricket well. <laughs> but you never had you never had the the numbers that would accompany foreign teams to Barbados coming over to Jamaica because there weren't sufficient hotel rooms in Kingston. Now that whole dynamic becomes changed and the assets of Sabina Park, Independence Park and the stadium opens up a whole new realm in sports tourism, for example, which would not have been there with that infrastructure. And that applies not just to the movement of people, but to the movement of commodities, which is underway. And there are a number of, of additional infrastructural activities uh, which are underway, for which due diligence is being done at various stages, including the privatization of Caymanus Track Limited, including the Jamaica Railway Corporation and other, and the Norman Manley Airport. And of course, there are assets presently within the government's uh, ownership, which we intend to remove from government ownership so that we can unlock the competitive dynamic of the economy to a much greater extent. And as we see the stock market moving through the 100,000 point barrier and beyond, we expect that this represents a, an opportune time to consider listing some of the, or divesting some of those enterprises through that particular mechanism. The Development Bank of Jamaica has been providing support, both financial and technical, to the MSNE sector, in addition to leading a number of significant divestments, such as I have mentioned, as well as the planning for, the, for further port development. Perhaps among the most significant changes in, in recent times, significant developments in recent times, relates to the energy sector. We are in a propitious moment where the price of oil has declined and it has resulted in some benefit as far as electricity prices are concerned. But equally significant is the more is the approximately 200 million US dollars that is now actively as we speak being invested in renewables in solar the largest solar plant is being constructed in the English-speaking Caribbean is being constructed as we speak on the southern Clarendon Plains. We have uh, wind turbines uh, being constructed in, in St. Elizabeth and, and Manchester and other renewable options have been, the, the OUR has just gone to market for additional uh, renewable uh, bids. Perhaps most far-reaching is the, is the recent contract signing with JPS for a supply of LNG from the United States market, which has opened up access to LNG and the first conversion as part of the, 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 the whole program of electricity sector reform that the that the ESET group, one member of which is here, um, has been working on, which will see the conversion of the bulk plant LNG and set the platform for the for the change out of the base load generating capacity of the JPS to uh, LNG, which will offer yet all of which will offer yet further reductions.
and that leads me to a final area of activity that will expand alongside these reductions in energy costs and that is the manufacturing sector which still has a tremendous prospect both for employment generation and for earning in the in the country so all told if i was to summarize some of the immediate next steps in this journey to achieve the sustained levels of growth at, and which you'll be able to read or can read now in the successive iterations of our memorandum of economic um, and financial uh, programs. There's financial sector reform, continued reform to strengthen the oversight capacity of the Bank of Jamaica, to reform the retail repo trade, to improve banking supervision, to expand the competitiveness in the, in the sector. Secondly, the issue of public sector transformation, many facets of which will result not only in improved uh, customer service, but also reduced transaction costs in many areas of doing business, particularly at our ports, but not restricted to our ports, to reducing development approval uh, times. In fact, we are already up to 87% of improved of approvals being completed within the 90-day schedule, but we need to do more in, in that regard. We, we also have to fundamentally reform pay policy in the public sector, compensation policy. You, we, we have to address. So the question of pay is really managing a, a walking through difficult choices. We have to address the question of better levels of remuneration fundamentally if we are to attract and, and, and keep qualified, highly qualified personnel to do the increasingly sophisticated tasks required by a modern state. But we, we have to do this at the same time as we manage down our actual costs and spend within the available resources. In addition to these reforms, we have to recognize also the need to maintain the macroeconomic stability, continue the trajectory, the downward trajectory on interest rates. We have to continue an investment program and ensure better returns for money in terms of government capital expenditures, particularly where infrastructure works are concerned. And all of this has to be done in the context of continued macroeconomic stability, fiscal prudence, and debt reduction. But, you know, I would say in conclusion that the, the, the example of VMBS and of other similar institutions continues to be an inspiration because founded in 1878 with the intention of empowering the population to help each other by pooling resources to save and acquire homes, that principle for many is a significant part of, as you have said, of their financial and economic independence. As a country, we also have demonstrated the capacity to pull together on a greater scale for our island home. The tasks that are before us don't belong to a government or any section of the community we will only achieve it if we can find the capacity among ourselves to develop the greatest capacity for collaboration and cooperation which is needed by any small country operating in a highly competitive 
global environment where the economic dynamic is still very fragile as we would have noted if we had looked at the news from Asia over the last couple of days. We face a challenging world. No one else has any obligation to negotiate through this world for us. Now more than ever we will be called upon to demonstrate whether we are up to the task that independence imposes on all peoples who cherish it. Thank you very much.